So I'm Helen, those of you who um, are new to me. Nice to meet everybody. I see a bunch of new faces um, myself. So I'm the staff person here for the County of Santa Cruz that does voter registration and outreach. And um, so I'm happy to share um, kind of our ABCs of voter registration when people are going out into the community and give updates about any uh, specific information regarding upcoming elections. So every year our, um, our elections and legislature changes some of the rules that go along with um, elections as we go through them. In particular, we had quite a few um, kind of nuances that happened through COVID. And as restrictions are lifting, things are going to change and kind of go back into the normal processes. So some of the things, I wasn't quite sure what you guys were looking at for the training. There's a, So I have included kind of specific details about going through and completing a voter registration affidavit and um, and then also specific information about the upcoming election, what the deadlines are looking like, um, what's going to be on the ballot for June that we know for sure already, things like that that are that can be useful yeah. to you guys while you're going out well, and talking can, to people. And we can share so, that with other people then, yeah. Right. Okay, so that's kind of what I did. So it's, it's, it's a long PowerPoint, but we can kind of um, pass over stuff quickly when we're talking about looking at the specific how to fill out the voter registration. Um, I'd like to also share with you guys a little bit about how to access some of the information that you can get off of the internet and the website. So that way, when you guys are talking to people, if you want to refer back to those websites, then you have that um, you can be a little bit familiar with it already because I'm showing you how to access those entry points. Okay. So, um, and they're very helpful. The other thing is that a lot of people at, at least what I have come to find out through my experiences working um, with voter registration is that they tend to prefer to do the online voter registration versus doing hard copies. So you might be encountering some of that and that, I definitely have because I had a specific request on we want to see what it looks like to go online and register people to vote. So each of the slide there's slides specific for going through that and that's the part where I say we can kind of just breeze through that pretty quickly. Okay, that's um, about, is that about QR codes or whatever they're, they're called? Right. So I will provide you with the QR code that you should like if it goes correctly today and I can share my screen well, then you guys can, if you have a smartphone at hand, you ah. can put your smartphone right up to your computer screen and scan that barcode. And then we can go to the website and I'll refer you through those slides that I have on my PowerPoint and you can see it on your phone. So, um, so then yeah. Then we can share that with other people. Then let's say right. that you, you can share that with other people. And the other thing is that I do have little quarter sheet handouts um, available that have the QR code on them that we give out during our outreach activities. And if oh, you really? guys, I can definitely send you an electronic copy and you can print those up. Okay. So that's one of the things that little handout um, that I have is the most distributed piece of material that I use during voter registration. I mean, people are more likely to say, I'll take that little quarter sheet piece of paper than they do the standard uh, voter registration form. They'll be like, let me just take that. I'll go ahead and scan it and do the electronic yeah. voter registration. So, um, so I can make that available for you. I do have to... Uh, See if I usually put a election date on that. So I'll have to make sure that I've updated it. I've been that's one of the things that I've been doing. And we are just in March and getting ready for June. But at this point, like everything's getting updated for the election specific information. So you guys jump started that for me on my PowerPoint um, so that I could make sure that everything's reflected here. 
Um, let me see. So I have a double screen on my computer. So let me see if I share my screen. Let's see, where is it? Here we go. Can you all see that? Uh, no. We can, yes. Oh, now, yes. Yes. You Wait. can see it now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me minimize this because I have a bunch of stuff open. Screen sharing. Well, where'd it go? I lost it. Let me see. Let me share. Why is it? When you're ready, if you could put it in presentation mode too, that would be great. Yeah. I tried to see. I'm trying to open it on my side. You guys can still see it? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah, I can't. Uh, Let me stop sharing it and reopen it again so that I can see it. All right. There we go. Share the screen. Okay. There we go. Now you can see it, right? Yes. Right. Okay. So, um, no. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Yes. Ballots, the, the ballots are going to be mailed on May 9th. May 9th. So those, that's the first date that the ballots are going to go out to um, Santa Cruz County voters, to all voters okay. in the state of California, actually. Um, I do have a couple of other slides that I'm going to share that um, will identify that our overseas voters and military voters have an earlier mail date because they need a couple of extra weeks. But this is the standard date that first mailing that will go out to all registered voters will happen on May 9th. So um, these are the requirements for registering to vote. You must be 18 years old by the next election to qualify to, to vote. Uh, you can read pre-register at 16 and 17 that gets you ready to vote when you're 18. Pre-registration is not a um, uh, automatic voter registration for those uh, minors. All it does is have their information on file. So when they turn 18, they don't have to worry about it. It's already in place for them. And we just about, when we go to mail those ballots on May 9th, at that point, everybody that is going to turn 18 by the election and be eligible to vote, we will send a ballot, even though their birthday is falling in between May 9th and June 7th, because by June 7th, they are 18 and they are eligible. So they will get a ballot, even though they haven't turned 18 yet, if their birthday falls between May 9th and, and June 7th. Um, otherwise, they won't get a ballot until they turn 18. Um, you must be a citizen of the United States. So even though they're 16 or 17 years old, all of the requirements for being eligible to vote still are in place. Uh, they must be a resident of California. The, um, recently, there was a change in the law regarding felonies and prison sentencing. So um, the most recent information on that and, and law is that people must not be in prison serving a state or federal prison sentence for the conviction of a felony. But so all, just recently, all information is fine, yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the things that um, I spoke with Renee came and picked up some voter registrations is that I have done work in the past with the Democratic Central Committee, and um, they have checked out quite a few voter registration cards. Those are all outdated based on this particular area where it is the affirmation where we're, we're signing our signature that we're attesting all the information is correct, that language has changed. So please do not use any old voter registration cards. 
But any, I have, I have all the, maybe, I have 50 new ones. Yeah, yeah, anything that may be on hand. Um, I think the last time I checked out voter registrations to the Democratic Central Committee, I gave them a whole case. And that whole case won't be no good. Okay. So if somebody, if I need to come and pick it up, I'm happy to come and get it. Just discard <laughs> it. I will check out more voter registration cards to you guys. The new ones, they, I mean, I received them this last quarter that I got my my um, my order. So literally, they're from within the last three months. Right, right. We don't want any legal problems. Yeah. Really? We don't want any yeah. kind of problems. And neither no. do <laughs> the ACLU will be on our our on us for distributing those old things that are outdated. So please do not use those. Um, the other thing that disqualifies people is if they've been identified as mentally incompetent by the court has to be a court uh, finding for them to be not eligible. Um, and it's important for us to remember that as we are out working with our community, we are not the police. We are not the watchdogs for um, whether or not the requirements and documentation for any of these qualifying factors are in place. We are just, our, we are just supposed to go out there register people to vote, allow them to determine how they, uh, how they qualify, whether they don't qualify, and, and, and bring it back and, and register them. Um, our collaborations that we have are with the larger umbrella entities within the state of California and the federal government. So we, we do our own, our own checking through those collaborations. So we have um, the California Department of Corrections, we have the um, Social Security Administration, we have the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, and we have the California Department of Public Health and the US Postal Service. So those larger umbrella agencies that we have collaborations with are the ones that help us determine how people um, fall within their, um, their qualifications. So all of those are the checks and balances that we do on a broader scale that you guys don't have to worry about. If somebody's saying that, you know, somebody says that they are, um, you know, had a felony conviction and they were, they served a prison sentence, for example, if they're not in, in, incarcerated at the time, at this time, then they can go ahead and register to vote. So if they're not eligible to vote, yeah. then the CDCR <laughs> will notify us as soon as we register them. So you guys don't worry about none of that, okay? We're not going to the jails, yeah. So yeah, you just, you just, <laughs> you just go ahead, and I go to the jails myself, and okay. and 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 sometimes um, some of the questions that come out from the inmate. I have to think about that question and how to respond to them. But for the most part, I mean, don't worry about it. It's not your job to police it. Just register people, bring it back. Don't worry. We do the check and balance here with those bigger umbrella agencies. And if somebody's not qualified, then they let us know and we they immediately cancel them. It, it, it's an automatic process. And so don't worry about it. Um, when should people re-register to vote? If they don't remember voting in the last five years, they should probably re-register. Uh, if they've moved, it doesn't even matter if they're still in the same apartment complex, but they've moved apartments, then they still should re-register. Um, if they want to change their political party, and I know you guys are working on behalf of representing the Democratic Party, so if they want to change from no party preference and register as a Democrat, then they will need to re-register, or if they've changed their name. So those are the only reasons why somebody needs to re-register to vote. Um, this, is a, this is our website. So our website, as you can see, is votescount.us. Um, here we have under current activities, offices on the ballot. You can click on the link and it's going to take you to the information specific for the election that's coming up. Um, you can access, oops, sorry. Um, you can access our, um, um, your voter registration status on our website. Go ahead and share my website with you here. Can you see that? Can you see the website? Yes, yes. Yeah. Is this the one that I just put on or do I need to share a new screen? 
It's yeah. fine. It's small, but we see so, it. So, so are you seeing? I just, I just selected a link. Are you seeing that? No. no not so okay. So let me share this new one then. Yeah. Here we go. There we go. So bear with me because I have not had to do this in a while. Okay. <laughs> so here's our main page. Uh huh. And then um, you'll see here the June statewide primary election offices that are up for election so each link if you want to know there you go these are all the offices that are up for election so right. i'm just sharing this with you so you can see what's available for you on our website in terms of information that you might want to access the other thing that's going on here for us is um sorry Ooh, what happened does that include this the statewide offices or, or not yeah let me see can you see my screen still? Because it just went yes. blank on me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me see voter registration information. Here we go. No. So you can look here, the candidate's manual. This is what they're going to be. Let me go back here. Um, accessing. If you want to know like who's running for office, you can select this candidate watch. And uh, in this link, it tells you kind of who already has submitted their information what's the final deadline actually for i'm going to go over the deadlines okay i have a calendar that i'm going to review for you okay. so and then but you can also access our quick calendar here on our website so this gives you kind of uh the dates for the non-period and the candidate filing and all of that but i do have a i do have a uh screen on our um on on the powerpoint that has the dates that i'm going to go over so just giving you guys an example of what you can access on our website the other thing is that um you can check your voter registration here and register to vote so this link here and i'm going to go over that with you on the powerpoint here's the uh register to vote button and my voter status so you can check your voter registration here and you can re-register here okay and then when we have our ballots then you can track your ballot here so um those are kind of this is uh, like in a nutshell this is what our website looks like and all the information you have available to that um so let's see I have a quick question. Did you uh -huh. say that it uh, this is accessible? It's votescount.us? Yes. OK, thank yes. you. Yes. OK, so here on our next slide is are those buttons that I was mentioning. So you have registered to vote and you have my voter status. So here, oops, sorry, how do I go back? Where did I go? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, you can just yeah register right online. Yeah, I'm trying to like uh, hit the back button and it's not doing it. Here we go. See, look at it. I'm like on the third screen here. That, is that the state side I'm now? I'm getting back. Instead of going back, it's going forward. <laughs> no, they don't need have to update their California Secretary of State. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it is. Uh, Hasn't been to D in a long time. Yeah, she, she's been there a while now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm hitting back. And instead of going back, it's going forward. Let me see. Just, oh, okay. Is this a county? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I got it now. Now I got it. Okay. So I'm trying to remove this screen from me so that you can see the barcode mm -hmm. and it doesn't like, can you see this right here? Yes. It's it doesn't want to go away. I'm not as live feed as rehearse. I don't know what that is. Why is it doing that? Oh, it's in the way of the barcode. It doesn't want to move it out of the way so you guys can see the barcode. I don't know how to get it out of there. Uh, shoot. Just so you know, when I click on the register to vote, I get Shirley Weber as Secretary of State, not. Oh. 
not the previous one. So you, you must That's need to, so Alex Padilla. It's probably the county that needs to update it. No, it's this right here is just this box is in the way. You guys can't. Oh, right, right. You guys can't. You guys can't like put your phone up to that barcode like I wanted oh, you to. I understand. Yeah. Could um, you do? Could you do a screenshot? Maybe and do it. Share it well, that that way, or would that not work either? Let me see. Wait, let me see if I could. Let me see. Let me see. Um, let me see if somebody's next door to me that can come over here. And so, or if we went to the website on our phones, then we could can go to the website on your yeah, phone, but I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of this box. It just populated <laughs> here. This is what it's going to take you to. Basically, this is the online voter registration. Once again, you can access it straight from our website on the buttons, or you can use that barcode and it's going to take you straight here. Um, and then you will select register to vote now or pre-register if that's what you are going to do because you're 16 or 17 years old. So you can see at the top here, each one of these arrows is the page that it takes you to. If you don't answer your U.S. citizen or resident of California, you don't qualify. So um, that's the first thing. That's where they need to answer that. Here, are they 18 or are they pre-registering? And then, um, and then they're going to complete where I have the arrows pointing, first name, middle name, last name. So it's a pretty quick and easy process. We're already on the, you only have five pages to go through. We're already on the second one. The third one here, you're going to, uh, your birthday is required. Um, here, you're required to um, provide us with some type of identification. So you're going to give us your driver's license. It does ask for the last four of your social here. When you do um, your online voter registration, it, I don't think, if I remember correctly, that it will only allow you to do one or the other. When you enter the information, unless you answer, I don't have a California driver's license or identification card, um, it will want you to complete both when you're going oh, through the are, online. Are actually the both required? Huh? Are they both required actually? When you're going through the online, unless you check the box that says, I do not, then it's gonna want you to fill in both, but you're not required by law to provide us with both. And when you're having people fill out the hard copy cards, they only need to provide us with one or the other. So, so in the hard, hard copy, you, you have to do one, it's required one or the other is that right? right and that is and that is the um section under number three right 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 yes so uh, under section number three of the hard copy then they only need to do one or the other and the next section is optional so if i don't have an arrow pointing to it then it's not a required field to be completed so this next one that talks about ethnicity and language preference is is an optional section the home address um, is required and um, you can identify a separate mailing address if you want to use a separate mailing address however a residence address is required for uh, your voter registration. Many people um, that go through automatic voter registration at the Department of Motor Vehicles, they put in a Dropbox for their address and it ends up messing up their voter registration because it's not allowed. That's the one thing that, that um, you should be mindful of when people are completing their voter registration is to not allow them to use a P.O. box for their right. residence. It has to be a real yes. place, yeah. Okay. And, then, so, and how do we do it for the homeless again? I'm sorry? For, for the homeless. Uh, how so I have a flyer to go over with you about registering people that are homeless. Okay, and that gives information and you're welcome to print out some of these. Um, I know you're, um, you're recording the training, but I can go ahead and 
make the PowerPoint available so you can sure, print sure. Up, so you can print up some of the flyers that are attached to it if you want sure, to. Thank you. The other information that I'm going to go over with you is UCSC and registering students up at UCSC, just in case you guys go up that way to do any of your voter registration drive, because um, they are they are a little bit uh, specific for how we handle their voter registrations on campus. So that's another part that we're going to go over quickly here. So party preference um, is a required field here. Um, but if they don't want to identify a party, uh, even though you guys are with the Democratic Central Committee, um, you should still allow them to register to vote if they need to. So here we're on the third page, vote by mail. Um, everybody in Santa Cruz County is going to get a ballot mailed to them. I'm going to go over that with you as well. Uh, State Voter Information Guide, they can opt out of getting the hard copy and getting stuff, you know, going online and, and reviewing stuff electronically if that's what they want. Um, and um, here they declare under the penalty of perjury, went over some of the stuff that I reviewed with you on eligibility. And um, we're almost done. So this is um, my voter registration because in order to share this with you, I had to go through the process. So here's the uh, kind of when you're checking your vote, here's your review of everything that you answered and how everything was completed through that process. And then you submit it and then you're done. Here you print, sign, and mail. You um, give authorization in order for the electronic process to complete for your signature that we have on file, as you can see, um, uh, at the DMV to attach to your voter registration electronically. Unless if the if the voter does not agree to attaching their voter registration then they are required to print out a hard copy of the voter registration affidavit that they just did online and sign it and mail it in. So this is instructions on if they do not provide authorization for their signature. If they provide authorization for their signature to be attached to their voter registration, then they have completed the electronic voter registration process and they are done. This is only required if they do not provide that authorization, then they need to, we need a signature to attach. That's part of how we verify who you are. So when you are um, signing your ballots, your signature is required for us to review and match. So we need a hard copy if you don't authorize the electronic signature. Um, and that's, that's it for the electronic process. So it's pretty quick. Five paid five windows and you're all done. So it allows you to provide an electronic signature. That's the last page, right? How does that happen? Huh? How does that happen? How, what do you mean? How, how do you give an electronic signature? You authorize the Department of Motor Vehicles to provide it to us. Oh, from my driver's license. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. So, so Helen, can I ask a question? Uh huh. So, if if they have a driver's license, they can authorize the the DMV to you to use that signature. Uh, That's correct. To use it, and if not, they must print this application out and sign the hard copy and then mail it in. Right. And okay. this page here that I did for you um, is if they do not authorize that way they know here it says signatures needed and mm -hmm. they need to print it's telling that's why the arrows there print print sign and mail okay. so this is what the step is if they do not authorize that electronic signature to attach to their voter registration Thank but you. if they do they're all done they don't have to print anything they don't have to mail it in we receive it complete and process it and actually our electronic transactions are processed faster than the hard copies because you guys are going to be distributing those hard copies then you take them back to wherever you're going then you have to send them over to our office then our office receives them in and we have to scan them 
and enter everything manually. When we get them electronically, all the data is done for us. So we don't have to go through all those steps. Mm -hmm. And it's a faster process for us to just receive the electronic ones. And they get done faster. Like for me, I was just, I'm just coming back from being out for COVID for three weeks. And, you know, I'm the one who does them. So I'm backed up from receiving stuff from January because I was out sick. So, you know, but the electronic ones were people helped me do those while I was out. So, you know, this is just an example for you on, on the processing between handling hard copies versus the electronic copies. Usually the electronic copies are, are handled and processed within three to five days and, and, and they're done. Um, so any more questions about that? So here um, is the information that we're going through for UCSE. Are you guys planning to go out to UCSE? I think so. I yeah. think I would like um, to we go out to UCSC all the time, too. As a matter of fact, we were just out there last weekend. So um, that's what I included them in this. Yes. Um, the campus is still is doing kind of a hybrid currently. Um, come spring, I have been informed that they will be going 100% to in-person instruction. Uh, but right now they are still doing remote and in person. So what does that mean for students? Um, they need to decide if they want to register using their home address or if they want to register using the address where they lived in Santa Cruz County. So that is kind of a standard protocol for all UCSC students, regardless of whether or not they're working remotely or um, go, attending classes remotely or in person. If they are, um, if they're on campus, I have a, a sheet that's going to be coming up that has the addressing specific for the campus, and I'll go over that with you. But regardless of whether or not they want to use their home address or their their uh, their address on campus at UCSC, a mailing address is required. If they live off campus here in Santa Cruz and they don't need a separate mailing address for their mail delivery, then it's not required. But if they're on campus, they need a mailing address for their campus. And then if they're registered back home in a different county and they want to, they, if, let me restate that, if they want to be registered as a Santa Cruz County voter, but receive their ballot back home because that's where they are, then they need to provide us with their mailing address back home and their residence address here in Santa Cruz. So that's how the law identifies um, students can register to vote. But it's their choice if they wanna register here or, or in their other county. As long as they have an address here in Santa Cruz that they have used previously. If they're a brand new student and they have not, we're talking about studying remotely, remember. Um, if they have not yet lived in Santa Cruz County and they are studying remotely, uh. then they have to enroll in the county that they live in because they have not established an address here in Santa Cruz County yet. Okay. Okay. So that's a requirement if they are new students and all they have done is studied remotely. But and they do, haven't we, established an yeah. address on campus. They haven't established an address in Santa Cruz County. So they need to, to be registered to vote back home. So, but if they have an established uh, registration, I mean, uh, address here in Santa Cruz County, then they can determine whether or not they want to register here in Santa Cruz County or if they want to register back home. Thank you. So, Helen, I have a question. Uh -huh. So students might change their mailing address, you know, every semester or what, I mean, so uh, do they need to re-register uh, each semester or each year because they you know move. they don't have the same I'm sorry time. I'm sorry so so it depends on the students because they're coming back to their they sometimes come back to the same college right right so if they're in the same 
college, then they don't have to re-register because they're still in the same college. I'm gonna go over the specifics. That's why we're going over UCSC. There are, there are two exceptions to that rule, okay? So here, if you, once again, if you're living on campus, be sure to provide your mailing address, which is what I just went over. And the attachment for residence addresses is coming up here. Um, if you register to vote using an address outside of the county, that's, once again, you need to decide where you want your ballot mailed. Most of the time, if they're on campus, then, um, oops, I'm sorry, this should not, um, I should have updated that. It looks like I forgot to. Um, if they're going to be on campus by May 9th, then they should receive their ballots here because otherwise it's going to get mailed back home and they're not going to be home for them to get it. So if, if they're going to be here in May, um, attending classes, then they should make sure that their ballot comes to them here in Santa Cruz County. Um, otherwise, if they're going if there were, if they're, if they're still attending classes remote and they're home, then they should make sure that their ballots coming to their home address so they can vote um, back home. So what you're saying is a student if they haven't established residence because of remoteness, they vote at home, but once they establish residence, then they can use that for voting or they can choose to still vote at home. They yeah, they, it's, it, the law says that students have the option of registering with their, with their home address or their college address. Mm -hmm. So that option is theirs. But if they've only done remote work and they haven't established their uh, address here in Santa Cruz County, then they don't, they're not eligible for that yet okay. because they haven't come to Santa Cruz to, to have a residence. But here on this, this slide, um, it gives the instructions on that in more detail. So here it says, I moved back home to study remotely. Where should I register to vote? So it answers that question. I want to vote in person. Yes. Even though you're getting a ballot mailed to you, you can still remote uh, vote in person. Um, Santa, um, UCSC has a vote center available on campus. UCSC also has a drop box for ballots on campus. Um, I give you that a slide with those details as well. Um, for the county, um, at least I have included what we have available up to date so far, because remember, we're still working towards getting everything in place for the June election. But I have provided you with as much information that we have on hand um, as I can. So here's information, or this page here will answer all the questions that students might have that are attending UCSC. Um, the Dropbox on campus is at the Quarry Plaza near the bookstore. That is there as soon as the ballots are um, mailed out, all of the drop boxes are open. So. 30 days before, 29 days before the election, as soon as we mail out those ballots, all of the drop boxes throughout the county are going to be available and in place installed and 24 seven uh, for people to drop their ballots off in. The uh, location on campus at UCSC is going to be the Stevenson Event Center. It's going to be open. We have three different schedules for our vote centers to do early voting for voters in the county. And um, the one at UCSC is available for four days um, of voting prior to including and including the election. So it opens on Saturday and is available Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday for voting at, on campus. And the uh, schedule is there for you. Um, they, once again, they can return it by mail. Um, they can have somebody else drop it off for them. This is applicable regardless of, of whether or not you're a UCS student or not. Um, 
can somebody else sign your ballot envelope for you? Absolutely not. Your ballot envelope is for you and you alone. We uh, only count that ballot if your signature matches the one that we have on file for you. And this has to be one of the most um, uh, confusing aspects of voting by mail for people um, that have multiple ballots getting mailed to the same address. So family members, for example, we always are getting ballot envelopes switched and people accidentally sign their daughters or their husbands. That's the most common kind of uh, signature switch that we get and everybody's used to it. So we, we accept those and we, we call what we call cure the signatures and we make sure that the correct, um, the correct vote goes to the voter it's supposed to go to. But you're not allowed to sign somebody else's ballot on their behalf. Um, here are the addressing. Here's the addressing for the UCSC. So um, as you can see here, your college residence which on the hard copy, Renee, that you took, that would be item number four for your residence. So this is how it works when you're dealing with UCSC. They identify their college name under the residence section, and then their mailing address is their PO box. So that's how the form needs to get filled out when you're doing UCSC. And when I go up to UCSC to do voter registration activities, I take a copy of this and I keep it with me and share it with the students. Uh, I find it handy because they tend to not know where they are. <laughs> you would be surprised but they're like what college am I at you know I'm like I tell them uh didn't you get an email that tells you where you're going or your ID might say on the back so this is helpful for them um the things that I want to point out to you that you might need to know is college nine see this dark highlighted section here and crown Merrill require the four digit dorm number. I think Crown Merrill only has three. And the reason for that is there's a district line that goes right down the middle of the building. So we need to be able to determine where the student lays their head at night. That needs to be available to us in their residence. So, oops, sorry. So for College 9 and Crown Merrill, those are the only two that it's required for. The other ones, um, we don't have to have their room number, but College 9 and Crown Merrill, we do, in yeah. addition to their mailing address. Otherwise, we can't complete the voter registration for them. These are continued residence addresses that you might have available over on campus. Um, there's an exception to 1156 High Street. Uh, the Farm Project is, are the only ones who can register at 1156 High Street. So if you're up there working at UCSC, people are they, they are not allowed to use this address as, a, as their residence address. They need to use their college. The only ones who can use 1156 High Street are the Farm Project. 1156 High Street is the administrative building. It's not a living quarter. The only other person, the only person that has that as their residence is the provost for the college. Um, and then you have these are the additional addressing that are available. Um, what do you do about a student? You said if they were a previous UCSC student, but they've, they're at home doing remote and you said they can register to vote, but what do they use as their sanitary? their previous address? Even though they're not there anymore. Well, they're they're yes, they're not there anymore, but they're still a student. So, and when they come back, that's where they're going to be going back to. 
But it's not if, likely they're going to go to a different college, now right? It's, it's not likely they're going to go to a different college because their majors at that college. So, so they're going to come back to the college and, and this is what the law adapted for remote learning for UCSC students. So this is going to go away. Now, remember, this is only available now because I've been informed by UCSC that they're going to go 100% in-person instruction again for the spring semester. And that starts in May. So in May, everybody should be in person and not doing any remote anymore. But if they were living previous to that off campus, they then use their college address, not the off campus address they had previously. They should use their previous address. If it's off campus? They've had an established address in Santa Cruz County. Okay. That is the address that they should use. Okay. But where okay. we it's kind of similar to what we what we do for people that are in the military and overseas. Okay. They're not coming back to the same address that they were at, but they were they were their last place of residence was okay. the one that they use for their overseas addressing. And this is what the law adapted for students to do remote learning. So it's similar to that. So whatever address they had established here in Santa Cruz County is the one that they can use for their voter registration. But remember, ballot Pat, you're only going to be doing this between now and I mean, we're already in March, right? Middle of March. So you guys are only going to be doing it maybe for a month before they're coming back to in-person instruction. Okay. So. But Helen, where will their ballot be mailed? That's where they have to give us the, the address. That's their determination. Where is that ballot going to be mailed? Where are they going to be at when we mail the ballots on May 9th? So it may not be a previous address. I mean, if they don't go back to the same living arrangement. They, right, right. We're not the ones who can determine that. The student does. That's how come the information it's that I gave you on the flyers says you need to determine because it's meant for the student. The student needs to determine where they're going to be when we mail ballots on May 9th. We can't identify that for them. They have to identify where they're going to be on May 9th when we're mailing our ballots, because that's that's where that's what the that's what's going to happen on May 9th. The ballots are going to go out. So the students need to determine where they're going to be when we mail those ballots so they can get it. So it's not necessarily a previous address. It's an address where they're going to be on May 9th. We're talking two different things. You guys are asking me about where they're going to mail their ballot and where they're registered to vote. Ah, uh, okay. I okay. See. You're asking me two different questions. Gotcha. Where they're going to mail their ballot is going to be determined by where they're going to be May 9th when they go out in the mail. Whether they not whether or not they want to be registered as a Santa Cruz County voter is going to determine what address they put as their residence. We're talking two okay. different things. Remember right. that because it, regardless of what county they're in, they still need to determine where they're going to be May 9th to get their ballot. Okay. So they can say, okay, you know what? I want to register. Uh, I got to tell you, in my experience, most of the students, especially the younger ones coming in, just go with whatever their mom and dad tell them to do. But then when they get on campus and everybody's kind of like, ooh, I want to do this and I'm voting for that, that's when they start getting kind of more independent in this area. And they want to be registered to vote on campus because the rest of their friends are doing all of it. And so, so, so I really can't tell you because in my experience, that's how it's gone. Right. It, so where they decide they want to register to vote, all we can do is give them the information. You're eligible to be a Santa Cruz County voter if you have established a residence here in Santa Cruz County prior to working remotely. Okay. okay. If you want to stay registered to vote back home out of county, then that's their option. Which one is your decision? And where will you be? So the next follow-up question is, where will you be on May 9th when we mail the ballots? That's the address you want to use for your mailing address. 
So you got to have two different conversations. This is the reason how come I share this with you because UCSC is a little unique in this in this manner, and it's 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 it, there's a lot of questions that come up with it. So um, it's going to be a lot more straightforward with Cabrillo or the high schools. Right. Cabrillo and the high schools are, you know, and, and, and all other voter registration. I mean, you need a residence yeah. address here in Santa Cruz County. This right. is only applicable to UCSC because there's right, students right. coming from out of town. And right. this 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 protocol and process for voter registration on UCSC for Santa Cruz County is um, not just Santa Cruz County. It's applicable across all state and university colleges. This is the way the law says that a student can register to vote. So it's not just specific to us. Um, so this is what the, when you go to check my voter status looks like online, um, you, it's pretty similar to what we looked at for the um, voter registration process. So I'm just gonna fly through these, but you can check, this is the data that you need to enter. Pretty, pretty straightforward. This is the data. So first name, last name, driver's license. Remember I said on the on the voter registration that the online process um, asks you to enter both your driver's license and your social security number. So here, when you're checking your voter status, it asks you the same thing and then your birthday. So here is my voter status when I checked it, it populated, this is what you get. This is what it looks like um, when you're looking at your voter registration. That's the information that you are gonna see. If you wanna see um, how you voted in an election, then you select the election here and it shows you how you voted. On our website, it just gives you, at least it used to, I haven't checked it recently, um, all of your voting history for all the years that you've been registered to vote. Our access shows you a little bit different because our website does our local information versus the state doing the state information. So here's the key dates. Uh, candidate filing happens uh, February 14th through March 11th. Um, if the incumbent doesn't file, the filing is extended to March 16th. So this Friday is the last day. Um, last day to call an election is March 11th. Arguments and analysis are due March 18th. Rebuttals are due March 25th. The, as I mentioned, the military and overseas ballots go out um, earlier. So April 8th is when those go out um, to our military and overseas voters. And then the first day um, ballots get mailed is May 9th. Our current voter registration here in Santa Cruz County is this number here, 167,000 plus. Um, the last day to register to vote and be on the rolls is May 23rd, but it doesn't mean that you've lost the opportunity to, to vote in the election if you miss this deadline, because the state has, um, has identified uh, uh, what we call same day voter registration or conditional voter registration. Um, it has to happen at a vote center. So um, you can only do it at one of the vote, vote centers. And um, what you do is you register and get your ballot at the same time. Okay. So how that process works is you give us the voter registration, um, we attach it to an envelope for you to put your ballot in. You can't take your ballot and walk away with it. Like if you were already registered to vote, you can go ahead and, and request a ballot and, and walk away and, and vote it and, and return it either a drop box or come in person, whatever. Um, when you're doing the same day voter registration, you have to be ready to vote your ballot at the time that you're coming in and requesting your ballot and filling out the voter registration. So that is now available to all voters in the state of California. And um, if they miss that deadline to vote um, um, May 23rd, they can still vote. What, what's the first day we can walk into your office and vote? That happens when we open our, um, our 29 day vote centers, which our office 
I consider our main command center here on Ocean Street in Santa Cruz. And then we have um, the other one in South County at the Watsonville City uh, Clerk's Office. So both of those are available for early voting. Um, 29 days before the election, every election, we have both of these offices open for voting. So it can be as early, as soon as those ballots get dropped in the mail, our offices are open for voting. Not May 23rd, 4th though. Huh? Not May 24th. So you're, so, um, you're gonna mail ballots on May 9th? Yes. Can I come in your office on May 9th? And yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. 29 days prior to the election, those two offices are open, just those two. So remember I said we have a, few, a couple of different staggered dates for our vote centers. Mm -hmm. So that's why. So we have the, um, as soon as the ballots get dropped in the mail, Santa Cruz County office, uh, elections office opens for voting and the Watsonville city clerk's office opens for voting and all the way through election day. So they're open at a Monday through Friday during this during this time and then then we open on the weekend before the election so that we offer weekend voting prior to the election so that happens may 24th through the june 7th okay. vote service centers open nine to five on saturday and sunday eight to five on monday and then seven to eight on tuesday and then June 8th, the canvas and the audit of the election begins. Next day after the election, we start. And then on July 3rd, that's the deadline to cure a missing or non-comparing signature. So remember, I was talking about those mismatched envelopes because people in the family sign them. Um, so that's that's um, that's a part of this section of the canvas. And then we have until July 7th to certify the election. Okay. Did somebody have their hand up? Uh, I have a question. So um, the May 24th to June 7th, it, are there other uh, areas uh, uh, or other polling places open besides the county offices? Yes. So I'm gonna go over those up here in these, oh, in this okay. section, okay? Um, Let's see, where was that? Okay, here, this is what's on the office for the June election. So lots of stuff, lots of stuff on the June ballot. Um, and you can find all of this information more specifically on our website where I showed you that link is at, if you want more information about what's gonna be on the office, on the ballot, I mean. So a, a lot of our locals, the assessors, auditor controller, actually our position, our department head, county clerk, Gail retired and Trisha took over in the middle of her, of her um, term. So she's up for election, county superintendent of schools, district attorney, sheriff corner. So we got a lot of stuff locally that's on, and then we have all the uh, state stuff that's available. And a county supervisor, of course, we have the third and fourth district that are seats that are open for them. So, and Friday we we is the deadline once again for people to file and identify whether or not they're going to run again, and whether or not we're going to have um, you know those those incumbents or seats open. So. We'll know more definitively by Friday. Um, and as soon as we get information, we're updating our website. So I confirmed that this morning before I, I got on here to talk with you. So ballots, this is what our envelopes look like. Um, ballot track to tack your ballot. Where's my ballot? That's a great service for us to have, and it tells you when it's been delivered. So this is what it looks like if you want to track your ballot and get signed up for this. Um, and then they send you texts, emails, letting you know that, um, you know, what's going on with your ballot, where it's at, it's been delivered, it's been, it's in the mail, you know, um, all of that. 
where you can return your ballot. You can drop it off at one of the 24 hour drop boxes. You can return it in person. You can return it to a vote service center or you can mail it. So these so far are the 24 hour drop boxes that have been confirmed for the county. We will add two more um, for, oh, you know what? I, sorry, I apologize. I cut and pasted over because I was merging two different uh, PowerPoints and it doesn't look like it did what I asked it to do for updating. So, um, but we will have two, oops, sorry. We will have two more aside from these. And we have the one at our office all the time. It actually doesn't get put away. We keep it out there all year long. Let's see why they put that. Um, voting locations, in-person voting locations. You can return a ballot, obtain a second ballot. Lots of people need a second ballot. Um, and we can mail them one or they can come into the vote service center and get one. The accessible tablet is available for them. That is also uh, Spanish language um, is the way that they can get a Spanish language ballot. We don't have them hard copies. All we do is provide a translated version of the ballot. So they don't get to have a, tra a, a translated Spanish hard copy ballot, but they can do one on the tablet. And that is required to go into a vote service center for that. Register and vote on the same day. So those people that miss the deadline and find themselves wanting to uh, register and, and get a ballot, they have to do that at one of the vote service centers or vote provisionally. Any other service that they might need, um, just come into a vote service center and we are ready to help. These are the uh, service center locations for June. So um, here identified E minus 29, the two uh, city clerk and Santa Cruz <laughs> County office. Um, e minus 11, so then we're gonna have these three that we already identified, I think we're going to have one more, but we don't have it determined yet. We haven't confirmed that one for E minus 11. So that means the 11 days prior to the election, 10 days prior to the election, um, these vote service centers will be open for early voting for residents. And they'll have 10 days worth of early voting in these communities. And then E minus four. So these are all the additional voter service centers that are gonna be open for the weekend voting. So everybody else here um, is gonna be open for weekend voting. This list is uh, updated as of today. So these have all been confirmed. This is gonna be vote service centers located in the county, as well as the drop boxes that I shared with you previously. And then have you all heard of our Santa Cruz County vote mobile? No. So we purchased a vote uh, like a trailer and we send that around the county and it's a pot, like a pop-up vote center. So you can do everything that you would do in, in person at our vote mobile. And we deploy it throughout the county. It usually starts going out right around when the ballots are mailed. So, um, it's a pretty neat little Who stacks these services? Mary, did you have a question, Mary? I see your hand I is up. I do. I just, I wanted to confirm that if you have a Spanish speaking voter, they have to go to the vote, one of the vote centers to be able to access the, the ballot in Spanish? Yes. Okay. They can get, they can get a hard copy if they want to do uh, you know, if they want to use a paper um, ballot, but the only thing that we have is a translation for them. They still have to mark an English ballot. Okay. Yeah. But the tablet, that's different. Then the tablet, they're going to get the, all the questions um, in Spanish and then they vote on it. So yeah, so then they, I, you know, I haven't actually um, gone through a Spanish 
version of the uh, on the tablet to see what it looks like because what happens it's not an electronic ballot it's an electronic process to access your ballot but then you print out a hard copy because california doesn't allow for electronic voting we only have hard copy voting so paper voting so when you go to the tablet you print after you mark your ballot on the tablet you print your ballot out and then you um, turn that in okay and that's the only way they can get a ballot in spanish is to go to a vote center yes and have it printed there yes i mean uh, they can okay. i i believe that they can request us to send them the translation but it's not a ballot okay it's a copy uh you know it's 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 like sit it next to your ballot and here's the translation for you but it sounds like they have to do that oh okay but if they go to the vote center then they can vote on the paper ballot that's in spanish okay i see the difference okay. yeah i mean they can just vote on the tablet and it's all in spanish there for them but i thought you said they couldn't vote electronically that so i'm confused well you can do use the the tablet is not an electronic vote we can't California doesn't allow for electronic voting. So, okay, so the, tablet, the tablet, the tablet you cast your ballot on the tablet. Have you seen it? Have you gone no, to the most? So it, it, it's like it, it, it's tablet. You know, I mean, like a you know, like a, like an iPad. Yeah, yeah. You vote um, on it, and that gets so you, that has the ballot on it. You vote on it, but you have to print a copy. You and can't, that gets printed. Okay, it's, it's not stored in there. Okay. Stored on the tablet. You have to print okay. the copy, and and then you turn in your hard okay. copy. I yeah. get it. Thank you. Uh huh. Pat, you had another question. Yes. Who staffs the voting centers? Poll workers. Now, just members of the public. Yeah, poll workers. Okay. Now, we've always staffed our polling places. Right, but those have just been on voting on election day. So you're you're going to have. What do you mean? What's your question? Well, because you... they're open early. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because with the they're voting. open, like some of them are open for 10 days in your ass. Yeah. yeah. So so they just come for 10 days. Yeah. So they're I still can, poll workers. I can, I can do something like that as a yeah. poll. Worker. There's well then, you know what? I'm going over some of that too. So okay. we'll go over that. Okay. Um and as look, recruiting election workers. That's what we're doing now. We're in the process oh, of recruiting election workers now. We need 200 people to staff the vote service centers. Okay, so we're recruiting now and we do have our poll worker application available on our website if you want to go back to our website that I shared with you earlier. And you can go to the section that says poll workers and uh, download the PDF and fill out the application and turn it in. My coworker Lynn is the one who handles that program. She receives them and then she responds and replies to people you identify we're really looking at people who can work the whole schedule so that we don't have a bunch of people coming in and having to shift things around so if all you, if you can commit to doing four day schedule then you know then we're going to place you at a four day site if you can commit to doing the 10 day schedule then we'll commit you to one of the 10 day sites remember we're only having four of those that we're you know what the law requires for us to offer and um and 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 I think based on our voter registration numbers, we got to have four of them for 10 days prior to the election. Um, we have 20 uh, people that we're recruiting to help us collect ballots from our ballot drop boxes that are placed throughout the county. This is standard stuff that we do every election. Um, we need an a, a additional 20 people to help staff our voter hotline, which is open for uh, on election day to help people with questions. And then we're looking for an additional 50 people to help with election night returns. Election is very busy. So uh, we always need extra help, all hands on deck for election. Uh, for us, people like me that are uh, regular full-time employees with the office and our election uh, extra help that come on board for the election specific activities, we easily, work a 20 hour shift on election day 
because it's pretty intense. Um, so these are some things on how we can work to promote voting. Uh, social media, using trusted messengers. I have found that trusted messengers are the number one biggest successful way of uh, promoting people to vote. It's people like you talking to people that you know and encouraging them to participate in this process. That's considered a trusted messenger and I have found that that is the number one most successful way of recruiting people to register to vote. The more you talk to them, there, I have had several people through the years uh, say absolutely not, I don't, I don't believe in it, I don't do it, you know, and talking to them, it's taken, sometimes it's taken me quite a few conversations to get them to change their mind. But, um, you know, that's the trusted messenger piece. Uh, precinct captains, um, I don't know what you guys are going to be doing with the Democratic Central Committee, if you're going to be doing any of that. Um, videos, in the last election with COVID, we relied more on social media and these types of activities um, to get out the information and engage people because we were limited in in-person contacts. Uh, Zoom town halls, um, um, honoring veterans. Um, it's one of the things that we've gone out to do is work, you know, uh, special events, which is another thing I think I'm gonna go over real quick. Um, any other ideas you might have? These are just kind of some suggestions for you guys. Uh, here's the uh, flyer regarding voting and homelessness. So if you are experiencing homelessness, or I like to refer to it as non-traditional housing, um, you know, you might be encountering people that are couch surfing because they don't have a place to stay. You know, that's considered being homeless. They don't have a normal place. You know, they're just trying to figure out where they're going to land next. So I, li I, I like to refer to it as non-traditional housing. I think it kind of makes them feel a little bit better about themselves than saying, oh, you're homeless and you've got a place to stay. Um, so what can they do? How can they register? Um, they, can, they can register using a cross street or intersection. The other thing they can do is identify a landmark, such as for Santa Cruz, people use the Clock Tower, the Mench Land, Civic Plaza Park, Harvey West. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few different um, landmarks that are available for people. The one thing that we do not want them to do is identify two streets that run parallel, <laughs> uh, you know, or identify I um, want to register at the 76 gas station on Highway 1. What? Which one is that? So, you know, something like that. We need it to be at least something that we can identify. The important thing is what precinct are they, what precinct, what, what area of the community do they want to impact with their vote? So that's kind of how I communicate with people that are in this kind of scenario, is where, where do you want your vote to count the most? Um, lo the state stuff doesn't really matter because all the state stuff is going to be relevant regardless of what part of Santa Cruz County they live in. But um, the local stuff is what's going to determine whether or not they're voting. For example, what's on the ballot for June um, um, for District 3 and 4 for the Board of Supervisors. So where are they at? Are they over here living in a tent behind my office at the San Lorenzo River? Or are they living over in Pajaro Valley um, in one of the encampments in Watsonville? Um, so that is where it's gonna make a difference for them. And as long as they provide a mailing address to go with whatever they determine is the area of, of the county that they want to live in, then we can register them successfully. If they try to do one or the other without providing both areas for information, they're not going to be registered to vote. So they cannot just provide us with a mailing address and say I'm homeless on their application where it says residence. It's not going to register them. 
Um, they do have to identify a residence address. Um, sometimes people use Coral Street as their residence address, um, which is completely legit. It's available for them to use as their residence address. Um, and it can be used without a mailing address because they're providing us with an address that's legit at Coral Street. But it has to be the one that Coral Street uses for their homeless shelter. Uh, it can't be just Coral Street homeless shelter. They have to provide us with the address is 115 Coral Street. And the, uh, the mailbox that's used for people generically is D. So that they do 115 Coral Street Apartment D, and then they don't have to provide us with a separate mailing address. But in any other situation, um, like if they're using an intersection or a landmark, they have to provide us with a mailing address. Uh, people ask, what do I use? Uh, sometimes organizations that are working with that population allow them to use their address to receive mail. So they can request that from uh, nonprofits or organizations in the community that might be working with them. Um, or they can receive mail at a family or friend's house. So they can use that as their mailing address. And that's the conversation I have with people when I'm talking about this with them. It, when they say, well, I don't have a mailing address. Do you have somebody that will let you use it um, to receive your mail? And um, they usually do. There's usually nonprofits that work with the homeless uh, population that will allow them to use their address to receive mail because they understand they need a place to do so. Um, and Coral Street usually allows people to receive mail there at the homeless shelter. Any more, any questions about this? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so they need, if, if they use a landmark or a cross street or intersection, is there a place for that as well as an address? I, That's I where they put their residence address. So here it is on the flyer here, see, what should be listed as a residence address? Cross Street Intersection Landmark. But when you're registering this way, a separate mailing address is required. So what can you use for your mailing address? That talks about that here. So the, yeah, the landmark or intersection, that's what goes in what's your residence address. So for, for Renee on the hard copy form that you got from me, the residence address is is section four and the mailing address is section five. Okay. So when you're looking at when you're looking at um, uh, you know the register the voter registration, those two sections, same kind of thing with UCSC. Remember, they're required to provide us with their college as their residence address, and then they're required to provide us with their mailing address on campus as a PO box or wherever they want their ballot mailed separately. So um, it kind of works the same. Thank you. When they're at, because when they're when they're registering with the a cross street, an intersection, or a landmark, and they don't have a mailing address, they can't get their ballot mailed. The other thing that that's important for you guys to remember is that. Um, People, everybody's going to get mailed a ballot. Everybody. It's whether or not you're identifying on your voter registration that you want to be uh, receiving your ballots by mail. Everybody's going to get in now. It doesn't matter. Even if you opt out of not wanting to get a ballot by mail, you're going to get a ballot by mail. How you vote. You still have the option of going in person, but everybody is getting a ballot mailed to them, 100%, if you're registered to vote. Okay, so if you don't have a mailing address and you're using a landmark, an intersection, a cross street, how are we supposed to get you your, your election materials? The other thing to remember is election materials are not forwardable mail. 
So if people put in that they're going out of town, that they put in a, a temporary hold on their mail or anything like that, it gets returned to us and we inactivate you because we weren't able to deliver your mail to you. And then you're not going to get anything else because it's been returned to us. That's something that happens quite often to people when they are not thinking and they do that and then they're gone and we send their election materials to them. By law, it's not allowed to be forwarded by the post office. So it has to come back to us. Then when we receive it back, we don't want to continue to send stuff out that's going to get returned to us. So we inactivate you, send you a notice saying that we've inactivated you and to contact us and make sure that you're um, all ready to vote in the next election. That's a process that happens all the time and people get pretty upset about it because they're like, I was registered to vote. How did you go ahead and change me? Well, it shows here that you did something at the post office. <laughs> we tried mailing your ballot or your voter information guide and we got it back and that's what happened. But I can take care of you over the phone over that. It's not requiring you to be registered to vote. Um, so, but that is if you end up getting having that conversation with somebody, at least you can have an informed conversation with them and say election materials, all election materials, it's not just your ballot or the voter information guide, any election materials that go out in our, from our office to a voter, if it gets returned to us as undeliverable by the post office, then we inactivate your account. So it's important for us to be able to deliver that mail. And in, they're not completely registered to vote if they don't provide us with a mailing address. The system doesn't allow us to register and complete that process because it's required the way that they're registering as an intersection cross street or landmark. The data, the data requires a mailing address to be included when we register somebody that way. Any more questions? I have one more question. Uh -huh. So the last sentence on this page that says, if you do not have a driver's license or state ID, you will need to print out the form, sign it and return it. So that means you don't need those IDs. You just mark those boxes that say you don't have it, but you cannot submit it electronically. Right. This is for the, this is for the online. Okay. Okay. This is going back to when I took us through that step by step and the last page of the online. This is back to that. Thank you. Yeah. But on the hard copy, it's, you know, they just need to give us their last four of their social and sign it. And most people that are homeless that are finding themselves in these non-traditional uh, housing situations, I find that they prefer to do hard copy voter registrations than online. Probably because of this situation, yeah. right? They're like, and they don't know. I mean, I get some of them I get and they're like, I'm homeless. That's what they put for their residence. And I, I can't send them anything. I can't even notify them that they're not registered to vote because they didn't give me a mailing address. So it, it, it's, they never complete the voter registration process. It never gets completed. So, and then they show up in the office. How come I never got my ballot? Then we explain to them and they're not happy, but you know, it's, 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 it, this is the part of voter information and education that happens when we're going out and we're doing voter registration. So that's a come I like to share this information with people that are going out and communicating with our community and potential voters that haven't participated previously, because these are scenarios that you'll come up with. You'll get these questions will arise. So that then is part of our, you said we're not law enforcers or whatever the term was you use. Right. But if they can't give us an address of where to mail it, then we just tell them we cannot complete the registration. Yeah. So you go ahead and give it to them. I mean, you take it from them, but let them know that they're not going to be completing the voter registration process without it if they're in this scenario. Not everybody needs a mailing address. 
Mailing address is not required for uh, people who have a regular traditional residence. Oh, okay. It's for people that are in these scenarios at UCSE where they're at, they have a separate mailing address um, on campus or if they want something delivered back home to a different address or if they're in a non-traditional housing situation where they're going to register with the intersection, a cross street or a landmark. Otherwise, a mailing address is not part of the required information and data that you need to collect. These are exceptions to that rule. Okay. Okay, so be informed and be prepared. Sign up, register to vote, check up, check your voter status, make sure that everything's the way it's supposed to be on your voter registration. And where's my ballot? Once those ballots go out, sign up for tra and track it and find out when you, you know, when, where your ballot's at in the process. Um, those are kind of like the three sticking points that we like to make sure that people are aware of through, um, through this going into the election, getting ready for the election. So this is my contact information. Oops. If you guys have any questions or if you need anything, if you want any supplemental uh, documents, from this, I'm happy to forward the PowerPoint to you. I'll go ahead and make a couple of those corrections that I saw on there that didn't get ap applied correctly when I updated everything um, and send it off to you if you, if you find it helpful. Also, um, I am going to be scheduling more voter registration drive trainings. And um, as we move forward, it's going to be getting pretty busy on my end for outreach activities. And I will go ahead and let you know when I have any more voter registration scheduled. Okay. And then that way, if you guys have more people that are interested in, in doing it, they can go ahead and, and if they're available, I usually try to do something that uh, a schedule trainings that can accommodate different schedules. So morning, afternoon, evening, different parts of the county, if I'm doing in-person, I think right now I'm still just going to do remote because I like doing the in-person because it's a little bit more interactive and I can help. I set up a table with um, examples of how I might set up a table at events or when I'm going to do voter registration training. And it's just, I find it more engaging for us to be in person. So I'd like to try and get back to doing some of those, um, but we'll see what happens. Everything's always changing. So go ahead, Rhonda. Uh, thank you, first of all, so much, Helen. Very informative. Um, I wanted to know, can you also send us, you were talking about that quarter page information sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. I will send the flyer for the quarter sheet that has the barcode on it. Okay, and I put my email address in the chat. I don't know if uh, other folks have as well, but I put mine um, up at the top of the chat, so. Okay. Thank you very much, appreciate it. You're welcome. Do you have okay. any particular ideas of uh, how to register uh, a good n number of people? Do, I mean, I have some ideas, but uh, I, I just thought I'd check with you if you. So. Um, I go about it or what? I, I find, I have found that, um, doing large events yeah. or piggybacking right. on activities that are taking place. So if you're planning to go out to Cabrillo, like I just reached out to somebody at Cabrillo yes. today, yes. um, and asked if there's any activities that are happening. Usually I go up to Cabrillo when they're having like- Actually, we're, we're planning to go there on the, on the 15th actually, yeah. Is, is there something happening? No, not particularly, but yeah, are they-, they are So I usually, I usually try to tag on to something that's going on already right. that is- that is going to yeah, more, um, more generate rock. like large numbers of people coming through. Exactly. Uh, I've gone up like they've done stuff for like, I think Halloween, they had like a club day and <laughs> all the clubs came out, set up tables and did stuff. So I've, I have participated and been invited to things like that. Um, up at UCSC, we just went to, uh, 
conference that they had there on the weekend um, that we were invited to. And then I was at Harvey West Park at another activity that was going on there that was an event for the community. So trying to be in places that generates a lot of foot traffic exactly yeah, are yeah. are gonna be um more fruitful uh, i have <laughs> also found don't be discouraged about the numbers of people that you register to vote right. um because <laughs> you you it's important to remember when you're doing it that um part of what you are doing is providing information and education to the community yes so you that is just as important and rewarding as it is bringing back those voter registration cards um and letting them know because people are like oh yeah they don't they don't know the nuances with voter registration they don't know that oh um your election materials are not forwardable and if you don't check your voter status you may be not registered to vote actively right now because we got something back from you right so you, yeah. so, so so people don't literally don't know that and yeah. they we have no idea how many calls we get when after the ballots go out and people are like wait a minute i haven't got my ballot mm -hmm. yeah they're like what happened how come i don't have my ballot so uh um when you're out doing voter registration drives that all that information that you share with them is just as critical as it is getting the voter registration back from them and for me that's what i tell people you know having contact and the and the other thing to remember when you're doing voter registration is that if you're sitting at a table and you're expecting people to come up to you to engage you in conversation, it's more likely they're gonna walk right by you. you you're you the to, one who you needs to jump to out. Yeah. engaging. You're the you're gonna get more people registered to vote when you're standing, right. you're, you're greeting them, you're walking up to them, you're talking to them. Hey, did you know that we're having an election people? The June primary people just like, whoosh, yeah 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 what <laughs> yeah what we're having an election in june so when you when you know striking that initial conversation with people as they're passing by you is going to be the more successful way of bringing back more voter registrations okay if you're sitting Absolutely, at a table yeah. and you're waiting for people to come up to you and you have signs yeah, and you, you have, have the, you have the information all out and right. everything looks all have, pretty yeah, one and, person nice. and one person jumping out yeah they're just gonna go by and be like and you can ask hey are you registered to vote oh yeah yeah and they'll keep going but if you stop and say hey are you registered to vote did you know you know and and then you stop and you catch their curiosity and then it's like you're fishing, you get the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you start talking and that's when they realize, oh, well, maybe I should check my voter status. What I do that is very helpful is I have people just get their cell phone out. Just like I said to you today that I wanted to share with you how to scan the barcode. That's why I wanted to do that with you because that's what I do when I'm out. I'm like, pull out your phone. You got a smartphone? That's my first question. Do you have a smartphone? And then when people say yes, then I get the I get the barcode and I have them scan it and I say, here, this is all you need to do. Look, it took you straight to the state website. You can check your voter status there. You can sign up for where's, where's my ballot and you can register to vote if you need to. And that um, is a great way to engage people and get them get their attention to stop and 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 get more information about what you have available so that's, that's the best suggestion i can do yeah, no, that's uh, we do we do uh several different types of events and activities mm -hmm. throughout the year and uh going to the high schools we have a oh, partnership really? with the superintendent of schools with, at the state level and the secretary of state that have identified what we call voter education weeks in the high schools and um 
Yeah, well, maybe we can plug into that. Yeah. And then uh, that happens in April. And with COVID, you know, all the schools have been shut down. So we haven't really had an opportunity to do very much of the in-person stuff that we used to. I would do previous, prior to pre-COVID, we did uh, countywide events. And I would have volunteers deployed at, I don't know, 10, 15 school sites on the same day. Oh, wow. And, and you know, and we we hosted Voter Ridge drives in that manner. Um, so I'm working towards getting us back to that point again, but we're just not there yet. I don't know if the schools are ready for we us to be there to, yet. We you know, I, to connect with, with the school districts to try to make it happen, but it's difficult, you know. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. we got to go school by school. Right. So, uh, I mean, if, uh, I always encourage people, if you have relationships with staff at the school sites, to reach out to them and get them to invite you to come on campus and do voter registration. You know what? I, what one of the things that we've done is just go during, during lunchtime. When all the students are coming out of class and hung, hang out on campus uh, with the voter registrations and do pre-registration on campus with the students during lunchtime.